Hello, BookTube. I have some new arrivals that I want to show you today, just a stack of books that are new or coming out down the line that I want to make sure you know about uh, in, the, in the, the instance that maybe some of them will interest you more than they interest me. Some of them we have seen on this channel before uh, in one form or another. A lot of them we haven't. I, just, I like to make these videos to make sure that you know as much as possible about what's coming out so that you can, if it's down the line, get a jump on getting your library to order it or getting your bookstore to order it, or that sort of thing pre-order it on Amazon, put it on a wish list of some kind. I like to make sure you know. Uh, so I thought we'd go through a stack of, uh, of those type of things and chat about them just a bit. A very, very hot Thursday. No better distraction from the heat of high summer than to sit and talk of books. <laughs> so let's start with number one. This is from the folks at Soho Press, and this comes out in October. We've already seen this book, but not explicitly this volume. Uh, this is a translation of a gigantic war and peace size work from the Japanese called Lady Joker. Uh, this is volume two. This is by Karu Takamura, and it is translated from the Japanese by Marie Lida and Alison Martin Powell. Uh, and this comes out in uh, uh, November. No, October. This comes out in, no in October. This is Lady Joker volume two. We saw volume one on this channel, which I believe was all black. This is all red. Uh, and this is the conclusion of Takamura's magnum opus of crime and decline. Inspired by the real-life Glico Morinaga kidnapping, an unsolved case that terrorized Japan for two years, Lady Joker reimagines the circumstances of this watershed episode in modern Japanese history and brings into riveting focus the lives and motivations of the victims, the perpetrators, the heroes, and the villains. Uh, since its Japanese publication in 1997, Takamura's society-encompassing epic has pushed beyond the stigmas surrounding genre and shattered the Japanese literary glass ceiling. Lady Joker Volume 1 addressed the sweeping dissatisfaction felt by those left behind by a culture whose new god, capitalism, finds no sacrifice too insignificant, no cost-cutting measure too inhumane, and no individual indispensable. Spurned and ostracized, driven to grief and desperation, the criminals at the heart of this groundbreaking heist story want soci what society has denied them, belonging, dignity, power, Revenge. They will purchase this with fear and outrage and pay whatever it takes. Uh, and I, I read the first volume of this. Remember, I remember at the time that it came out, me sort of pining that I wished that Soho or somebody had taken a gamble and just printed volume one and volume two together as a gigantic brick of a book. I would love to see that. I don't know that it will ever happen. I don't know that, it's, that it came out that way in Japan. Maybe it didn't. Uh, but volume one was very good. There are uh, long portraits at the beginning of Volume 1 that do a fantastic job of dramatizing the world of the so-called Japanese salaryman and the, the pitiless sort of endless gray grind of corporate culture in modern Tokyo, modern Japan. Uh, and then the story blossoms from there, but it, it, does, it pays you the compliment of expecting that you will want to know a lot about the groundings of this thing. So I was reading that, and I was thinking, okay, well, then this could lead some unimaginative critic to say this is too long, and that a, a lot of that foreground it could be done in a few brushstrokes at the beginning of this volume, that this could be one big volume instead of two big volumes. But uh, I loved it. Even in English, I loved it so much that I didn't care. So Lady Joker, part two, is coming out this autumn. Uh, then we have something for the gays. you got to have something for the gays. Uh, this is coming out in early October. This is by... Billy Ray Belcourt, and it is a minor chorus. It's a small novel called A Minor Chorus. Uh, in the stark expanse of northern Alberta, a queer indigenous doctoral student steps away from his dissertation to write a novel. Informed by a series of poignant encounters, a heart-to-heart -heart with fellow doctoral student River on the mounting pressure placed on marginalized scholars, a meeting with Michael, a closeted man from his hometown whose vulnerability and loneliness punctuate the realities of queer life on the fringe, Woven throughout these conversations are memories of Jack, a cousin caught in the cycle of police violence, drugs, and survival. Jack's life parallels the narrator's own, and the possibilities of escape and imprisonment are left to chance and colonialism stacking the odds. Uh, I don't know if this is... Uh, oh, this is. Okay, this is Billy Ray Belcourt's, Belcourt's debut novel. And from that description of the novel, I don't think I need to tell you that the author himself is the main character. Uh, th there'll be virtually no changes at all. 
We shall see. I love debut novels. I love the broad blank page that they represent. It could be that this will be terrific. Uh, I'm always up for uh, mainstream gay fiction. I'm not so much up for the implied characterization in that description, which again may not be the book. That is the pub sheet only. The, that in, that implied world, the implied world in that in that description, that you know that it's amazing that gay people are allowed to write fiction at all. That there's never been an example of a gay novel before. That that that. that queer identity in rural Alberta has never been addressed in print before and maybe is against the law and maybe these people's houses will be raided. That, that kind of Orwellian thing, it's, it's bad enough that it is making its way back into society for real. There's no reason to jump the gun and say it's already here. But, but this could be really good. Uh, Autofiction tends not to be because it, if the author is convinced that the story is already told, that the reader is already impressed, not by the story I'm telling, but by the boxes that I tick. Am I indigenous? Am I queer? Am I the author, I'm the hero of my own story? If you go into your, the endeavor of writing 100 pages of fiction, already convinced that your story is already told and that your reader is already impressed, then what on earth motivation would you have to write an interesting drama? You wouldn't have any motivation to do that. And you would be scornful and also immediately break out insults of a personal nature to anyone who said that it was poor drama. We shall see. We shall see. Could be that none of that is alive in the book. Uh, then we have uh, this next one. You film buffs will want to hear about this. It took me a minute to realize uh, who this author is. Uh, this is the another debut novel. This is a debut novel by an actor named Michael Imperioli, who some of you will know, I guess, from The Sopranos. And this is The Perfume Burned His Eyes. So for once, we have an interesting American cover design, and for once, we have a good title. For once, I don't have to complain about either one of those. <laughs> this is going to be a paper acquisition. It's going to look like this. It's going to be $18, I think. Uh, I think it's going to be an $18, $17 paperback. It's going to look just like this. So it isn't a normal-looking trade paperback. This is a normal-looking trade paperback, and they are not the same size. This is, this is distinctive, in other words. The title is distinctive. The cover is distinctive. Good. Props for that. And Michael Imperioli is an actor, and he wrote a book. That is usually trouble. <laughs> Let, uh, I am assuming, 2022 being what it was, what it is, that this is straight up autofiction. That this is an autobiography that he has not had the cojones to call an autobiography because that tanks your sales. Uh, let's see here, though. Matthew is a 16-year-old boy living in Jackson Heights, Queens, in 1976. Was Michael Imperioli a, a teenage boy in Jackson Heights, Queens, in 1976? How much you want to bet he was? Uh, after he loses the two most important male role models, his father and grandfather, his mother uses inher his, her inheritance to uproot Matthew and herself to a posh apartment building in Manhattan. Uh, although only three miles away from his boyhood home, the city is a completely new and strange world for Matthew. And it's about to get a lot stranger. <laughs> if you think you know what's coming, you don't. Uh, Matthew soon befriends and becomes a factotum of sorts to Lou Reed. <laughs> The Lou Reed, <laughs> who lives with his transgender girlfriend Rachel in the same building. The artistic shamanic, shamanic rocker eventually becomes an unorthodox father figure for Matthew, who finds himself head over heels for the mysterious Veronica, a wise beyond her years girl he meets at a new school. Uh, so <laughs> this, is, this is a novel that, at least in part, stars Lou Reed, uh, who hasn't been fictionalized all that often. I am guessing that this is all... Uh, Michael Imperioli's own story. I find it hard to believe that uh, somebody who's been in acting for 25 years would have the fictional inventiveness to come up with an entirely whole cloth story that involves Lou Reed and his transgender girlfriend. I find that hard to believe. I'm thinking this probably all really happened. Doesn't stop it from being a good book. In this case, or in Billy Ray Belcourt's case, it doesn't stop it from being a good book. Uh, so we will see. <laughs> we will see. Uh, uh, then this next one is a fairly standard thing. I'm always up for it to be done well, uh, but it, it's 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 not a new as a concept. It's this thing. It's called. It's by Benjamin Webb, and it's called Science, Truth, and Meaning: From Wonder to Understanding. And it is a big, heavy thing. It's got heavy stock paper. Uh, I don't have any information on it. I don't have a sheet on it, so I don't know how much this is going to be. But I bet it's going to be expensive. Uh, and this is all about uh, 
it's it's a broad overview of science. So cognition, the quantum theories, uh, general physics, relativity, astronomy, all that sort of thing. I don't have any kind of sheet for it. Uh, so let's just see what the back says. This book presents a scientific and philosophical examination of our existence. On the one hand, it demonstrates and celebrates how our broad scientific understanding is reducible to common foundations. On the other, it confronts and analyzes whether the metaphysical truths we construct from this knowledge are absolute or are relative to the physical and mental limitations of the type of being we are. In essence, the book addresses the meaning of the scientific deductions we have made and how they profoundly influence our conception of existence. So fairly big, heavy stuff, fairly, fairly heady material, but I'm always up for that, especially if it's done with spirit. I just, you'd have to look this thing up. If you like uh, popularizing science volumes like this, and this seems interesting to you, you'll have to look it up, because unfortunately I don't have any information on it. I don't know how much it costs, but the sheer weight of it makes me think this will be expensive. Uh, and I also don't know when it comes out. So, you know, you'd want to you'd look it up. This is a type of thing. It's a broad overview. Oftentimes, uh, library purchasing agents will like broad overviews because that makes them think, this has legs. I can, this will be money well spent. I can justify this expense because this book will be on the shelves for years. So you could sell it that way if you're, if you're, if you're in with your library's purchasing agent. Uh, then we have, I think this is another debut. Uh, uh, let's see here. Let's see if I'm right about that. No, okay, this is not another debut. Uh, but this is uh, a novel by Suad Amri, and this is called Mother of Strangers. Uh, and this is uh, a novel of Jaffa, the city of Jaffa. And the cover is a little bit weird. The, the, the boy, the, that archival photo of a boy, he's in an ornate suit. That becomes very important in the course of this novel. And he's standing on an orange and that also becomes important in the course of this novel. But let's, let's hear about it. I don't have a sheet for this either, but it's a finished copy, so it's probably coming out in August. Uh, and this is from uh, the award-winning author of Sharon and My Mother-in-Law. And this is a darkly humorous and profoundly moving novel set in Jaffa from 1947 to 1951. Some of you who know the history of the region will know immediately what that means. Depicting life just before and at the beginning of the destruction of Palestine and the displacement of its Arab population. Based on the true story of two Jaffa teenagers, this book follows the daily lives of Subi, a 15-year-old mechanic, and Shams, a 13-year-old student he hopes to marry one day. In this prosperous and cosmopolitan port city, with its bustling markets, cinema, and cafes on the hills overlooking the Mediterranean Sea, we meet many other unforgettable characters as well, including Kawaja Michael, an elegant and successful owner of orange groves above the harbor, Mr. Hassan, the tailor who makes Subi's treasured English suit, which he hopes will change his entire life, and the very mysterious and outrageous Uncle Habib, who insists on introducing Subi to the local bordello. With the thriving orange export business, Jaffa had always been a city welcoming to outsiders, the quote, mother of strangers, where Muslims, Jews, and Christians live peacefully together. Once the bombardment of the city begins in April of 1948, uh, the author gives us uh, the grim but fascinating details of the shock, panic, and destruction that ensues. Jaffa becomes unrecognizable, with neighborhoods flattened, families removed from their homes and separated, and those who remain in constant danger of arrest and incarceration. Most of the population flees eastward to Jordan or by sea to Lebanon in the north or to Egypt and Gaza in the south. Subi and Shams will never see each other again. So in part, this is a study of those, of those people, but in, in part, it's also a dramatization of the destruction of old Jaffa, which if you go on Google, I'm sure you can find pictures of what it used to look like and what it looked like during the bombardment. Uh, I have never read a book set here. The, uh, the last book I read set in Jaffa was set in Jaffa centuries ago, the historical novel. This is too, but far more recent vintage, so in living memory for some people. So it, it's, it's not the author's debut, but it is a breath of fresh air. It is a new thing. I wonder if this is translated. Uh, let's find out if this is translated. No translators listed. So it could be that the author wrote this in English, but a breath of fresh air, a new kind of thing for most readers. So just wanted to let you know that it was coming. Uh, then we have something coming out in uh, next year. This has very general interest. I think a lot of you will probably be interested in this. And it comes out in January. So that's a long time to get a jump on this and start saving your pennies 
or start getting it pre-ordered. Make sure your library has a copy and get yourself first on the list. This is by Danielle Claude, and it is called Koala. <laughs> a natural history of and an uncertain future. And that's all that this is. It is a natural history of koalas. Uh, I don't think I have a sheet for this either. No, I don't. Uh, but we'll, let's read from it here. Koalas had regularly appeared in Australian biologist Daniel Claude's backyard. As they do. They'll wander into your yard. I've seen videos of them many times. I've never met a koala. I've never been to Australia. Uh, I would like to meet them. They seem fascinating. Uh, but when a threatening bushfire turned her attention to them, Claude soon realized that there was a lot to learn about these popular yet enigmatic animals. So she embarked on a journey through evolutionary biology, natural history, and ecology to understand where they'd come from and what their future holds. And when we talk about bushfires just last year or the year before that, epic bushfires in Australia that killed huge numbers of koala. Definitely don't go looking for the footage of that. Try, if you're curious, try to narrow your search to video footage of burned koalas who were saved, who were rescued from those bushfires. Quite a few were, but your heart will break if you watch the rest of the footage. Try not to. Uh, starting with fossils of ancient giant koalas, including unexpected new findings, she explores why this species is the lone survivor of a once diverse family of unique Australian marsupials. In vivid descriptive prose, she investigates their endearing characters and their physiology, from pouches to the gut bacteria that bonds them through a few particular gum tree species. Now, as koalas are in serious danger from human environmental destruction and explosive wildfires, Claude reflects on how we can protect this iconic and beloved species and distinctive trees they depend on. Uh, that is going to be fascinating. Any animal-specific natural history is always fascinating for me. I always end up learning a lot. I want to point out here, I don't mean to sound heartless, but that last claim is wrong. Koalas are, in fact, extremely easy to preserve in captivity. What that last claim really means is koalas in the wild are extremely endangered. And they are. They are. Because out-of-control wildfires that sweep over the equivalent of whole countries are just going to become a fixed part of our world. This is going to become a burning world. In the, two, in the 2030s, that will barely matter at a headline. Uh, and that will destroy the natural habitat of the koalas and also all of Australia's other mammals. It will destroy their natural habitat. But uh, unlike, for instance, platypuses or maybe giant kangaroos, koalas are easy to keep in captivity. They, they're, they have extremely limited dietary needs, which can be duplicated and synthesized. And they don't do much. <laughs> I mean, they don't, they don't cover a huge amount of terrain. They're not violent or territorial or anything like that. They're easy to keep in captivity. So they will not vanish from the face of the earth, except that that is a little callous because the wild ones will. And that's heartbreaking. Uh, so I will learn a lot from this. I, I, uh, I know that all of us have spirit animals, right? And there's no way to criticize that. No matter what your spirit animal is, there's, you don't have any control over that. And no one should shame you for that. And I bet there are people out there whose spirit animal is the koala. You now have a book coming that you're absolutely going to want to not only read but own. This comes out in January, so mark it on your calendars. Uh, let's just keep going. We've got some time left here. This next one is, uh, uh, I've got a finished hardcover here, a naked hardcover, and I don't have a pub sheet for it, but it's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, it's only got blurbs on the back, and I don't think I have any kind of summary on the inside of the book. No, I don't, but that's all right. It, like I said, it's fairly self-explanatory. This is by Michael Gamboni, and it is called Modern Conspiracies in America, Separating Fact from Fiction. And there you have a burning American flag. And that's what this is. This is a, a, a new book in hardcover. I don't know when this comes out, but I'm assuming if this is the hardcover that it's out in August. Of an overview of the various most pervasive conspiracy theories in modern American history. It's got a bunch of blurbs on the back. Oh, wait, it does have a description. Great. Uh, in this book, historian Michael Gamboni provides case studies of popular conspiracy theories in America for the past 100 years. From the Protocols of the Elders of Zion to Stop the Steal, he offers an approach based on logic and historical case studies designed not to win arguments, but to help readers separate truth from the avalanche of nonsense descending on us every day. In each case, Gamboni outlines the conspiracy claim, provides historical context for the conspiracy, presents evidence of the conspiracy claim, and analyzes the claim, the context, and the evidence. Which is exactly what you want, right? You don't want that on the nightly news. Nightly news cable programs think they need to bring on a nut job who seriously believes anything 
in order to balance their account. That is absolutely not true. You do not need, if you are doing a 15-minute a segment in studio on a Q conspiracy, you do not need to bring on a Q nut job who thinks that Hillary Clinton is a baby-killing Satanist. <laughs> it's an obvious lunatic thing. You don't need to bring somebody on to talk about how earnestly they believe it. But it, you, as a reader, might still want to know where all this stuff comes from and why anybody would believe it. And that's the approach this author takes, which is really neat. So we have uh, the table of contents. We have the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. We have the assassination of John F. Kennedy. We have 9-11. We have Sandy Hook, chemtrails and contrails, the 2016 election, the 2020 quote-unquote pandemic. So was COVID-19 planned by the government or multi-governments or the Illuminati for some reason or other? So this gets fairly up to date. The next chapter is on Q the mother of all conspiracy theories, because it allows for all the rest of them. And finally, the Stop the Steal, which is Q. I'm not sure what kind of a job the author is going to do distinguishing those. They're the same thing. Stop the Seal is, is Q. Uh, but there are going to be all sorts of things in here that I don't know. Probably not about JFK and probably not about 9-11 either, but the rest of it, there are going to be all sorts of things that I don't know. Uh, so if you are into conspiracy theories and feel like I do in 2021, a little bit embarrassed about that. In the 20th century, you could be into conspiracy theories and just laugh it off and go out for burgers and beers. In the, 20, in the 21st century, it's become completely tribalized, but far more pathological. It, if you are still interested in them like I am, you might hesitate to tell people that uh, because of the effect that social media has had in completely destroying our collective sanity. If you're looking to read a sober account of those things, this is it seems like that book. Uh, and it's probably out now. So make sure you knew about it. Then we have uh, another forthcoming book. This is for November of this year. And it's a known quantity to quite a few of you. The author is Toby Wilkinson, who's done a number of popular studies of ancient Egypt. And they've all been really good. Uh, so those of you who are fascinated by ancient Egypt will already know this author's name. You will probably like his work. I've reviewed a couple of his books for a couple of periodicals whose checks didn't bounce. And he has a new book coming out in November, called Tutankhamun's Trumpet. Ancient Egypt in 100 Objects from the Boy King's Tomb. And that's what he does in this book. He analyzes, Tutankhamun was buried with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of objects. Uh, and he analyzes 100 of those objects. Let me see, do I have a sheet for this? Oh, yes, I do. Okay, great. Uh, let's, let's read about it instead. Uh, they were just found piled willy-nilly. But Tutankhamun was buried with, as Egyptians tended to do for their nobility, uh, he, he was buried with, with all the objects that any of his priests or hangers-on thought he might need in the afterlife, which they didn't view as much different from, from our life. Uh, let's see here. In 1922, after 15 years of searching, archaeologists finally discovered the tomb of King Tutankhamun. So you get the reason, for, one of the reasons for this book is that we are living in the centennial the centenary of the, of the, it's the anniversary of the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. Uh, there, buried alongside the king's mummy, they found more than 5,000 unique objects, from the mundane to the extravagant, from the precious to the everyday. Tutankhamun's spectacular gold mask is justifiably famous, but the rest of the treasures remain largely unknown. Their stories untold. I can only think of two books that, that talked about them at all. Uh, in this book, uh, the author allows 100 artifacts from the Boy King's tomb to speak again, not only for themselves, but as witnesses for the civilization that created them. A gold-decorated chariot reveals the impressive scale of Egyptian technology. Loaves of bread, baskets of fruit, and jars of wine hint at the fertility of the Nile Valley and the abundant feasts enjoyed by its people. Ebony and ivory from Nubia and a jewel of the Libyan desert, glass, show the range of Egypt's trading and diplomatic networks. And perhaps most poignant of all the objects in the tomb is the one that conjures up the lost world of human experience, Tutankhamun's silver trumpet. Uh, I so, saw this thing and immediately fell in love with the pros prospect, and the prospect is all I need to fall in love with when it comes to a book like this, because the author is already a known quantity. I know that Toby Wilkins will, will not drop the ball here, so I don't even need to think about it. If I'm 100 pages in and I'm noticing one tinny note after another, then it'll be not only be very surprising, but it will be comment worthy. Then I will stop and take a, a mental step back and say, okay, what's going on here? Were you, did you have COVID when you wrote this? Did you get someone else to write it and put your name on it? 
but I don't think that's going to happen. And that's nice. That's a very nice thing uh, about an author who is a known quantity. It's very nice when you can just write them out of the equation, so to speak, as a reviewer, but also as a critical reader. You can just write this author out of the equation. You know he will do a good job, so you can concentrate on the job he's doing. Uh, so though you ancient Egypt nuts, you've got a big, interesting book coming out in November. Uh, just a couple more, and then we'll be done. Uh, this next one is also coming out in November. This is uh, a new murder mystery series. Those are always interesting. This is from the folks at Minotaur Books. Uh, let's, let's get to the paperwork here. This is by Ausma Zahanat Khan. That is the author. And this is Blackwater Falls, which introduces a police detective named Inanna, Inaya Rahman. Inaya Rahman is the police detective in Blackwater Falls. Uh, Blackwater Falls is the first in a timely and powerful new crime series by this author, who uh, the pub sheet says is critically acclaimed. Uh, in the Colorado town of Blackwater Falls, girls from immigrant communities have been disappearing for months, but the local sheriff is slow to act and the fates of the missing girls largely disregarded. At last, the calls for justice become too loud to ignore when the body of a star student and refugee, the Syrian teenager Razan al Qader, is arranged in a crucifixion-like pose in a mosque. Detective Rahman and Lieutenant Wakas Saif of the Denver police are recruited to solve Razan's murder and quickly uncover a link to other missing and murdered girls. But Inaya gets closer, the closer Inaya gets to the truth, the more her partner finds ways to obstruct the investigation. Inaya may be drawn to him, but she is wary of his motives. He may be covering up the crimes of their boss, whose connections to Blackwater, the mercenary outfit, uh, run deep. Inaya turns to her female colleagues, attorney Arisha Adams and detective Catalina Hernandez, for help in finding the truth. The three have bonded through their experience as members of vulnerable groups and now must work together to expose the conspiracy behind the murders before another girl disappears. So this comes out in November. I have never read this author before that I know of, and this is the, this is the place to start. This is the beginning of a new series, and that's always fun. Uh, and the culture clash issues here, the, this will obviously deal in part with the immigrant experience in America. Uh, and placing it in Colorado is therefore a canny move. You can tell already from that description alone what is worrying me about this book. I won't have to worry about it until November. But what's worrying me is that all the men in this book are going to be evil. She turns to colleagues she can trust who are women and who by their names are Hispanic and black. And... Uh, can't trust her male colleagues. So are all the men in this book evil? Uh, and also are all the white people in this book evil? Why has the town sheriff not investigated a string of disappearances of young girls? Why has he not bothered? Why is he disregarding that? If he's disregarding that because he's involved, because he wants to sweep them under the carpet, fine. Not fine. <laughs> not fine in the, court, in the world of the book, but fine in the world of a novel. That's fine. That could even be, it's a little predictable, but it could even make for an interesting third act. If he's ignoring them because he's white, or because he's male, and because white men are brutal, brusque, uh, totally evil racists, then this is going to be disappointing. I, very, very disappointing. There are too many books like that. There's too much talk like that. That is deeply, deeply bigoted talk. I would rather not see it directed anywhere at minority marginalized groups or anybody else. Uh, we shall see. I find it hard to believe that a thing of this prominence, coming from uh, from Minotaur Books, who do such a great job with their works, I find it hard to believe that it could be so Twitter one-dimensional. So I'm just going to believe that it's not, until it proves me otherwise. I will get to this in the autumn, but I wanted you to know it's coming. A new murder mystery series set in the immigrant experience of uh, Colorado. That's pretty fascinating. On its own, right? And also there's the tick and clock element. We don't know who's doing this, and we don't want anyone else to disappear. We don't want anything else to happen. That tick and clock element is always good. That's always good fuel for a police procedural, which is, I guess, what this will be. Uh, so if you're interested in police procedurals, if any of that strikes you as interesting, a lot of this does, this is a jump-on point for this new series, the first book. Uh, and then we'll finish up with the finished copy of something that we've already seen on this channel. I just wanted to bring it to your attention again. Uh, I don't think I have a sheet on this. Oh, yes, I do. I do. We've already seen this, but this is coming out, uh, if I have a sheet, then I probably have a date. Yes, early September. So this is a month away. Uh, but some of you will be interested in this. I certainly am. <laughs> this is by John T. McGreevy, and this is A History of Catholicism. 
This is the finished copy of his new history of Catholicism. A pretty thing. A well-designed thing from the folks at W.W. Norton. Uh, and what do we have here? Uh, the author has written three previous books on Catholicism. And in this book, he tells the sweeping history of the world's most global, multilingual, and multicultural institution. Not just religion, but institution. Opposing factions within the church have fought on all sides for the past three centuries, most significant events, including the emergence of nation states and democracy, the rise and fall of colonialism, and the challenges posed by industrialization and new understandings of gender and sexuality. By asking how did we get here, I should, it should say new interpretations of gender and sexuality, not new understandings. That implies that they're real. New interpretations. But anyway, it doesn't matter. By asking how did we get here, McGreevy convincingly makes the case that a full understanding of the modern world and its most pressing and intractable problems is impossible without understanding Catholicism. What an amazing claim. I have the advanced copy of this, and I haven't got to it yet. Uh, but now I have the finished copy, and this is what, let's, let's give you some details here. This comes out in early September, and it's going to be $35. And those of you out there who are interested in the subject, it sounds like this is a completely new approach to a sweeping history of Catholicism. Catholicism has had many sweeping histories, but it sounds like this is a completely new approach by somebody who's put in the legwork, who has done the time. Uh, so if you are interested in the subject, if you are a Catholic who likes to read about Catholicism, you definitely want to know that this is coming in a month. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, those are some new arrivals for your consideration here. We have Catholicism. We have Blackwater Falls. Uh, we have Tutankhamun's trumpet about the things buried with the boy king and what they say about him and Egypt. Uh, we have Modern Conspiracies in America, a naked hardcover that maybe is out now. We have Koala, a new natural history of koala bears and uh, their future. We have Mother of Strangers, a novel about old Jaffa and its destruction. Uh, we have Science, Truth, and Meaning, a big sweeping book about modern science. Uh, we have The Perfume Burned His Eyes, uh, the debut novel by the actor Michael Imperioli, uh, coming out in an original paperback. And we have A Minor Chorus, the debut novel by Billy Ray Bellancourt. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Lady Joker uh, by Kaoru, Ka Kaoru Takamura, volume two in uh, an enormous book about a headline-grabbing Japanese uh, kidnapping case has been fictionalized into this enormous work of, of uh, police procedural. So there you go. A pile of new arrivals of, of forthcoming books that may be of interest to you. They cover a wide variety of subjects. If there's anything of interest here, I thought you should know about them and know what's coming across the desk here at Hyde Cottage. Uh, but I'm going to wrap this up for now. This has gone on quite long enough. And I will be back. Thank you, BookTube.